Bonjour. <laughs> That's all what I can say. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here today, and I really like Normandy, so it's, uh, it's one of my favorite places in France. So in my talk, I want to um, talk about uh, multi-objective optimization and decision-making in intelligent systems. And I highly believe, you know, um, nowadays everyone is talking about deep learning, AI, even the... Um, president on the region who was saying the word deep learning and I believe that the methodologies that we have in operations research they are even uh, more important than those approaches for AI and technical systems. I personally believe that uh, decision making is something essential for technical systems of tomorrow, today and tomorrow and with this talk I want to give you an overview what are the challenges and probably I remain I will give you more questions than answers to some of these, these aspects. So uh, the talk is, um, I will first start with uh, decision making for human, human users. And uh, I will talk about one approach that we were working with Airbus and the human users said, no, don't give us an entire Pareto front, give us only two solutions, which is also very difficult to select them and help the human decision maker to make the decision. But once we have two or three solutions selected from that, then the question is, can a machine make a decision making on its own? So now it is no human brain, like the, one of the sponsors here, the decision brain, the brain decision, was, what was the name of the sponsor? Uh, there is no brain. The, the machine has to decide on its own. And I will bring you uh, some examples that you will see that if you want to have fully autonomous systems, we really need to give the ability to the systems to think on their own and decide, select one of the Pareto optimal solutions. Then the next step is that if they can do it in real time, real time means that on the fly. So you are going like a cat and mouse. A mouse is going as has to permanently make a decision. You don't have much time to go through the calculations. And uh, then the question is, if you have that limited time, can we optimize and decide? So this is one step more than only making a decision. And uh, the next question, which would be very interesting for me myself is, we have one individual uh, who is making a decision, but can we have a collective? Can we have a lot of individuals making the correct decision and all in these all ways? So can a collective make better decisions than one individual? And, um, and how can we influence that? And I believe that if we change the environment a little bit, manipulate the environment, maybe we can influence their decision making. And this will be the, the last question that I want to address here, what is the influence of dynamic environments on the decisions? Usually it's a negative aspect, but can we have it in a positive way? So now I come, I bring the slide that everyone here in this room is knowing that. It's the slide on multi-objective optimization. So usually multi-objective optimization we have, let's say, without loss of generality, we are minimizing several functions subject to a search space. And uh, here is an example, you, all of you know that. Imagine we have two functions, f1 and f2, and we want to optimize, minimize both of them at the same time. And we know the solution to this is not a single solution, but a set of solutions, which we call them Pareto optimal solution. So many algorithms are out there, like evolutionary algorithms. These are the algorithms that I work myself on them or a swarm, particle swarm optimization, or any other approaches that you can take. And what happens there is that we want to find as many as possible solutions. Let's say um, in, we're using evolutionary algorithms, which are population-based approaches. We want to find uh, many solutions here with a well-distributed well -distributed along the front and uh, with a good approximation. So we really want to find, hopefully, Pareto optimal solutions. And many of us, independently, if you use evolutionary algorithms, population, one point, or any other approach, what we do is that we use the domination criteria, which we can discuss about that, if this is good or not. But in domination criteria, we have sort of um, partial ordering. For example, if you are minimizing A and C are dominating B, 
and uh, A and C are indifferent to each other. So if you have a decision maker who wants to make a decision, you would say, okay, you have A or C, select one of them according to your preferences, and that person will take, um, either he knows what he wants, or he takes a weight vector and says, okay, I have R1 and R2 as two variables, the sum of the R's should be equal to 1, so I will select uh, according to my preference, for example, if one of them, uh, either C or A. So now, um, this will change if you do not have two set of solutions, uh, two dimensions, two objectives, but they increase the dimensionality. Usually the result of such algorithms, if you have three functions, three objectives, three criteria, you will see in an Excel file like this. And if you give it to some uh, decision maker, he would say, forget it, I, how can I select? Or he will sort them and then he will select one of them from here. I actually worked with geologists and they, I was delivering very good Pareto sets um, in this form and I said, this is not helping us, you have to tell us more. We can also visualize them in this way. Here you see two sets of non-dominated solutions for three objectives, but it's also very difficult to, to take. Here we have eight objects, and this is the parallel diagram, that um, a parallel coordinate that you can see that even selecting here will be difficult. There are approaches where people try to visualize that more in details. For example, one of the approaches uses the uh, self-organized maps, uh, you uh, basically reduce the eight dimensions or the three dimensions into two dimensions and then here you have the features that you extract and by the way this is one of the neural network approaches that people were using and now you can cluster these solutions into groups and each group is presenting um, basically one, this is the shape of a wing of an um, airplane and you can see that they are, being, they, they, are, they are clustered here in this group. So when you click on one of the points here, you will see one line here, uh, or even more than three dimensions, it could be more, and then you can see what is happening there. There are also other visualization methods. Visualization is one of the key aspects in, in operations research. We all know that. There are toolboxes, one of the toolboxes. For example, you can also do heat maps, uh, plot objectives, and and the parameters, variables, we put some numbers, and then you, basically what we do, we want to help the, the decision maker. But here again, the problem is, very, it is very difficult to select one of the solutions. And one of the approaches, one of the projects I had with Airbus, they have a UAV centers, and there is a man who is very simple, sitting in a control station, and he has to make a decision how many UAVs, and there are big UAVs, they are not small ones that we take, and you will see later in my slide. They are big UAVs, and he has to decide how many of them have to go on a mission, and he has to make a decision on his own. So if you provide him a Pareto front of these solutions, he doesn't know which one to select. So there are, there are questions. Um, there is actually one question, can you provide only the important parts of the non-dominated front to that human user? And um, maybe some of you are familiar with that. This is the approach which is called knee points. So if you have a front like this, let's say two-dimensional, and again we are minimizing the front on F2, and let's say the Pareto front has a certain shape, I would like to have more information about the solution C than uh, having solution A or B. Why? Because A and B, they might be a little bit better than C in terms of F2, but much worse than F and in terms of F1. So the question is, how can we provide only, let's say, the solution B, C, and E to the decision maker? Now he has really three solutions that are far from each other, and also the C is the point that makes a difference. So if you change from C to this area, it has a lot of change in one of the functions, let's say A and C, or C and F. And C is the point that is the knee point, it's like, um, it's a changing point. So in order to do that, we could change the definition of domination. So instead of dominating, we had it before, for example, A is dominating this area shown with a red line, 
And now what we do is that we define something which is called cone domination. So we increase the angle between a, these two lines. Now we have these two areas. And instead of, and these two lines are shown by omega. And this is the same domination, uh, the same uh, definition. But instead of f, we take omega, which is the transformation of these two lines. And uh, we have now these lines with certain angles, the phi angle that are here. I don't want to go into the details, but if we uh, go into, uh, you want to know how to measure that, it's basically a transformation. You take the function values, you, you have to know the angle, how much you want to open. The more you open the angle, then you dominate a lot of solutions. And, um, and uh, so this is one parameter that we have to set. And then um, you can go through the transformation. The transformation is uh, written here. But as I said, I don't want to go into the details. So now doing that, let's go to the application in UAV Center. They have seven functions to optimize at the same time. So um, most of them are conflicting. We can discuss about certain, uh, some of them, that they might not exactly be conflicting, but we put them as an objective still to make sure if there is any conflict. And, um, and what you see here, if I visualize two of them, let's say cost and make span, make span is here and cost is here, and what you can see here, the red line, the red line is showing the one without finding the knee points, and the others, they are the ones, the other colors, any of them, is showing the solution, the knee points, this point, this point, and this point are delivered to us. Now, if you look at the numbers here, these are the, the NSGA2 is an approach that we use in evolutionary multi-objective optimization. But if you see, if you increase the number of objectives, the two is not really interesting, actually, for us. But what you see here, these are the number of solutions in average that we could find as an optimal solution. For, uh, if we don't use this knee approach, knee point approach, we see for two dimensions, we have in average 4.7, let's say five solutions that you can see here, one, two, three, four, and five. And uh, for three, we have 24. And for seven objectives, we have 199 solutions that we give it to the simple guy who has to make the decision. And now, if we use this uh, with different angles, so for example, angle 120, 135, 150, you can see that we can decrease the number of solutions that we deliver to the decision maker. Here, for example, for seven, we have, uh, for seven number of dimensions, objectives, we have about 7.8 in average solutions that we can give to him to make a decision. But any of them he, make, he takes, we know that this is uh, something interesting and, um, and it is easier for him to make the decision. If he, even if we increase, and you can see here, if he can increase the angle, to 150, we can find in average one or two solutions, which are exactly the knee points there. So this is the human user. But uh, that is, even if we have two or three solutions in technical systems, still the systems, they have to make the decisions on their own. Also, the human user has to make the decision. And this is the research topic that I am really interested in robotics. I will show you now a video of a machine and um, um, I have a robotic team which we go to the robotic competitions like the RoboCup, World Cup, German Open. And uh, one thing happens is that we never, we always optimize them in terms of one objective. We never, no one in robotics is talking about multi-criteria optimization. I don't know why. This is actually one of the essential things that they have to do. And um, here, what you what you, will you see in a second, is that, um, so this is a team playing, and um, they optimize them for a ground, which is a very stable ground. And in a robotic competitions, basically what we do, we train our robots in laboratories, so they are perfect. We go to the competition, and they change one or two things without telling us. 
And that our teams, they have to train everything, they have to change everything there in the training day. And this, is, this video is the first day of the training day. Of course, everything is not working, but you will see, if you only optimize your system in terms of one function, you will lose immediately. And the systems are not adapting themselves to the environment. In that year, they changed the carpet here to one of the very thick carpets, you know, the thick carpets from IKEA. They changed that to this, and you will see what's happening. <laughs> so, <laughs> they can't stand. Actually, this is not my team, by the way. <laughs> so, but also there are different applications. For example, here at Fukushima, um, when it happened, when it, I was telling, because I have so many friends in Japan, I was thinking, okay, this is Japan. They will send some flying robots inside the building and they will find the radioactivity. They couldn't. They said, no, we can't, because if the building looks like this, it's a dynamic environment. We cannot uh, let our robots go in. They cannot, they are not flexible enough because they are only optimized in terms of one one function, basically. They don't give them the ability, they don't optimize them for several options to then, because they have to make decisions on their own. So there are different challenges, actually, it's not only decision making, there are also other challenges, for example, adaptation to the dynamics environment, flexibility, robustness, external control, so we have no external control if we go on a fully autonomous mode, we have very bad communication or even local communication. Um, capability and then one of the things is that we want to have decision making. If I can give these robots the ability to make a decision to change their variables from to jump from one parity of one to another, then they could be able to, to do that. So um, let's go through the real time aspect. If you want to do a real time decision making, many of us know how but how it could work. Here's an example Let's say we do a preference-based approach. Let's say we have an agent who is moving in this environment, and he has to decide on two object, obje objectives. One objective is that uh, to go towards the point of interest, so this red point will be point of interest, and then to avoid the danger, which, has, which are these, um, these uh, lines, the three points that you will see in a video. So what happens in his brain is a simple, Per, um, well, he has all the ways he can go, let's say 32, or I think he has 16 points that he can select to go. And for each point that he is going, let's say if he's going uh, forward, he measures the distance to the red point and the distance to the danger and tries, and then he has these sort of solutions. And uh, one of them, this is danger, and this is the uh, distance to the point. And you will see what is happening in his brain. So if I run that, you will see So this is made by one of, uh, for a computer games actually. I don't know if you played Unreal Tournament. This is the background behind the Unreal Tournament. So uh, here, if I let it run, you will, uh, you will see what is happening in the brain at real time. So you see here the solution. Sometimes the front, parietal front is here, and it will select something based on the constraint um, optimization. And sometimes, uh, so, and he, he is doing a very nice, well, we actually designed it to perform a nice movement. And you see that he's uh, going uh, very smoothly along these uh, dangerous points and grabbing the point. Now, what I would do is that we say, okay, we change, we, everyone here knows how to do that. We, we give him preferences. We do a weighted sum approach, the simplest one that everyone knows. Let's say I select weighting. And here, I make him a little bit. So in this way, if I change his weight, he's not going, even if he's interested to go towards the red point, now he's not going anymore. And you can see here the way that he's selecting the Pareto solution here is, uh, is well, it's a simple way to time. We can also change his preference, which he cannot do it on his own. Uh, we can change it, for example, to some, some very large value, let's say, to 
and now it's, it's going through the dangerous point. So it means with this reference, uh, with this weighted approach, we can actually help the, um, the agent to make a decision. We can, of course, define different types of agents. One agent which is very simple, always afraid of danger. You can give different weights, and then you have different characters actually for your game. For example, in Unreal Tournament, you, have, you can have an agent who is only optimizing in terms of one one, one uh, objective, and the other one is the other, or someone that is selecting a half and half point. This is the way it is working. I'm not going into the details, but you <coughs> define a reference uh, weight vector for uh, that the agent, which I did, and then it will find the denominated solutions. They normalize that, and then applies its um, ref preferences on that, and it, it will find them. So um, now. Let's make it a little bit more difficult because there is no optimization in this. It's, this is something that we actually knew, and I'm interested to do the optimization. So it is not anymore multi criteria decision making, but now let's do optimization. So here you see uh, the example that I said. Let's say this is the mouse, and the mouse has to make a dis a, not only a decision, but it has to find an optimal way. <laughs> In order to do that, I will define a game here, which is based on the traveling salesman problem. And traveling salesman problem, you, we, already, we all know there are different points shown here with the blue points, the cities. Now let's say it's the game, and the traveling salesman is the space shuttle. Moving here, there is a, it's somewhere here. And one thing I do is that um, I give a limited time to learn and optimize and select. So from each point that this is going from this point to the other point, I give him also some difficulties. For example, the environment, where well, the traveling salesman problem uh, is always going from one point to the other, the sequence, the permutation is defined by us. Now it is not anymore fulfilled because we add some physical constraint. That is actually in logistic is not a new thing. You know, you, if you go somewhere and there is a traffic, then the, the, this is not fulfilled. So then you have to you have some delays. Here we have changed the environment. For example, we have the the lava here, which is uh, destroying the agent, or we have bouncing areas here. When the agent goes there, it is uh, hit by the bouncing area. You can also see the three objectives. We have. Uh, uh, three objectives, time, optimize time, optimize fuel, and optimize damage. And uh, it's an unknown environment, so we cannot have, we can make the sequence of the cities, but that is of no use to the agent. So if I let it run, so you will see it's very slow here because it's actually doing the optimization. I make it a little bit faster. So you see how it is moving. It is moved in a very, very uh, different way that, that we expect. So how is it working, actually? How can we do that? And that was one of the research areas that I was very, I'm still very interested in. It's based on, actually, the approach which is called Monte Carlo Tree Search. That's the approach that AlphaGo is, was using to one, of the, one part of that next to the deep learning. And the Monte Carlo Tree Search is made for one objective. So it means if you have one objective function, you can use that and use it because this is an greedy approach. But once you come to this, uh, to this problem, the three objectives, time, fuel, and damage, then you cannot use the Monte Carlo tree search. And uh, so here is a visualization what happens, and then I will show you the equations of the Monte Carlo, multi-objective Monte Carlo tree search. Basically what happens is that the agent starts here, um, the agent starts at the point, starting point is given, and for 40 milliseconds is the time that we have, it makes, it goes through different solutions and each line is shown as one solution. For each line, it is measuring the values for time, fuel, and damage, and estimating the next point that it wants to visit. And as you see, we cannot really know the entire game. So this line, one line is the amount of time that it has uh, to, uh, to search for the optimal solution. And you can see here that we have a search for a population of them. 
And, um, and um, I will show on the next slide what it actually, how it works. But one, th one thing you could see is that if you had a traveling salesman problem, uh, as a solver, you would definitely pick this point. And now the agent knows that it has some physical constraint, it is not picking this solution to, um, and it, it, it will actually take it at the end. I will make it faster. So this is the way that the decision making and optimization work. Even if the solution, I mean, this was also taken at the end, the normal traveling salesman would take it in the here after this solution, but now here it moved up and came down. And we showed in our papers that this is actually more efficient if you go towards the, the permutations that it goes. Now, how does it work? Many of you might know the Monte Carlo tree search. Monte Carlo tree search is an approach which, which many of the people who work on that, they say it is working, we don't know why. So, um, because there is a lot of randomness inside. So it is for one objective function. It is for optimizing, let's say, one, one, uh, one, one um, objective. And what one thing you do is that you are a certain state, let's say, at a certain point in that area. And in that point, you try to estimate, using something like dynamic programming, you try to find different ways. Let's say here we go three ways. And the video you saw many ways. And then one thing you do is that you basically you make a tree policy, you make a tree as long as you can. And uh, since you don't have much time left, at the end of the time you try to do a Monte Carlo simulation, which is a random, just a random guess for several times to the end of the game, which basically it's randomness. And um, then you go back and uh, go towards the greedy approach. So you take the one, the line, the, the, um, the way that is giving you the maximum or the minimum for that certain function. This doesn't work for multi-objective problems because in multi-objective problems we have three values that we can use, three functions. So it's very difficult to, to, do, to find that. And one thing we did was, uh, again here I don't really want to go into the details, but this is the area where we, we have it from before, from the Monte Carlo research, but this is the number of times that we visit a certain node and so on. And then we add here something which is an indicator. So indicator means that you have uh, like hyper, hyper volume. I don't know if this is known to the Operations Research Society. So it means that you look at how well is the per, uh, non dominated solutions that you found and you integrate it in the equation, and in this way you can have a multi-objective Monte Carlo approach. And the node itself is being used uh, by, by weights, so uh, here you can see different maps, unknown to the agent, and this is the weight at different cities, he's selecting the weight, and one thing we do is that, for example, the first weight means, the one means that he's only optimizing the first function, second function, third function, and the third one is actually interesting, the third one is showing that he's changing his weight all the time. So at each point that he arrives, he's not anymore uh, going for the first one or second one or third one. He's trying to see which one is the better for him. So if you look at them, we can see that uh, at the end, uh, this variation of this, the values that we have, uh, it's even giving us very good results. Now let me go one more step and ask, Good, one agent can make some certain decisions in real time. You saw some examples, maybe I left some questions for you. But can we make, can a collective make a better decision? Can many people make better decisions like voting, voting for Trump or not Trump? So is it a good decision or is it a bad decision? So, um, and many biologists were, were discussing, they were analyzing that in the nature. And here is an example from Ian Cousin, who was at that time in Princeton, and he trained two groups of fish. Um, um, so let's say this example has actually many arms, but in the real uh, value, the one that I want to show you, let's say we have several, 16 actually fish, and eight of them we train to go to the stripe, and eight of them we train to go to this color. So it means if we only had 
that group of fish that were trained for A, they would all go to A, ignore everything else. If we had a group of fish only that were trained for B and were swimming here, they would go to B. And then he put these two groups together and added a, 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 another branch, which is a consensus branch, which is a combination of both. It has the stripes and it has the color. And what happens was that um, over 50% of the agents or the fish were going to the consensus. So here you see um, uh, um, some, some statistics. So we have target A, target B, and consensus. And you can see here, uh, out of 16, 9.92 in average uh, went to the consensus line. So my team and I, we decided to analyze this because Ian Cousin, when he was proposing that, he said it's only collective. And I said, no, there should be something more than a collective. There should be maybe some individual decision making inside. And the agent, everyone, every time that the fish is going, is deciding, should I follow everyone else or should I go to my own trained group? So there is some individual, let's say, multi-criteria decision making for the agent who is thinking, uh, optimizing two, two, two functions, my own or the others. And um, so we, we found out actually if we do this individual decision making, we can actually um, achieve what the nature is doing. And then it brought me to some other ideas in, um, in um, optimization. In optimization, if you have a lot of solutions moving in an environment, let's say these. <laughs> They are searching in an environment for two points, two red lines, and um, they gather themselves in certain areas, and then at some point they, but they don't know the red points, but they at some point they eventually go there. This is the, um, actually the methodology that we use in an approach, which is called particle swarm optimization. In particle swarm optimization, if you want to solve an optimization problem, you define a set of random solutions, as you saw here, they were randomly distributed over this decision, the decision variable space, and then uh, they were exchanging information, and every solution decides to which direction it has to go. Actually, it is called uh, leader selection. So, collective search optimization in unknown environments, and every individual decides where to go. And so it means that in his brain, we actually implicitly have sort of decision making that we want to implement. This approach is actually used a lot in robotics. If you have a lot of robots moving in a certain environment, let's say Fukushima, and you want to find a point with the highest radioactivity, uh, you, don't, you cannot describe that, you can use such an approach to identify those solutions in the room. Or the, for example, also one of my projects with the fire department, uh, if there is fire in a building, we send the robots and they identify the points with the highest temperature. So you can only do this with a robotic ap approach. So the equation for that, I actually don't want to go through it, but everyone is selecting a leader. So every of these individuals <coughs> is basically solving an equation. And, and in this equation, there is a factor which is says which direction you have to go, the gradient information that he's using. Now, if we have this, I will add some individual decision making into that and say, okay, now we do not say uh, to follow the best in your population, but follow the one, uh, for example, that is giving you um, um, more um, energy so that you can save some energy. And here you can see um, an individual makes a decision while doing the optimization. We say in his brain, he is optimizing the profit, how much profit it is for him to go to a certain point, and how much energy is for him, or how much cost it is in terms of energy. So in the brain of the agent, like I showed you before in that uh, program, uh, these are the other solutions, and then he has to decide to go towards this or to go towards this. Again here, we can do some sort of um, preference-based method. You can define, give him some preferences. You can also have agents with different preferences in the population. Again, you can define this R as the, the, um, the, um, 
the weight vector, or it can make it even adaptive, and then it selects, uh, decides about its movements based on its own energy level. So if it has a lot of energy, so it might, might go towards this, but if it doesn't have energy, it might go towards this. And you see how it is working. So imagine we have a swarm of uh, individuals, and here we have a default approach, and he, here we have the decision makers. And you can see here, of course, the decision makers, because they are not doing every movement that you are telling them, they are slower than they, the, these individuals here. You can see here also, this is the best function value over time, and the blue one shows that they are not as fast as the red one, which is the default. But if you look at the amount of energy consumption that the decision makers have, this is the, the value shown, this is showing us the amount of the average movement, and we see that blue ones, they have less movements than the red ones. We can also change the test problems, other problems, these are the problems that we can actually use in robotics, and you can see here uh, it's even worse for this um, default approach, so they can actually um, um, save a lot. And also this is a little bit slow, but eventually they can find uh, the optimal solution which could be here. The next step is that we put these individuals in a dynamic environment. Now the decision making is getting even tougher. Imagine you have a set of flying robots like I have in my lab, and you're flying and there is a wind coming. And if you add the wind in the environment, the decision making is not working. And uh, so um, there are different ways of solving this problem. And uh, here we have, for example, each individual, when it is moving, is deciding to go towards the swarm to uh, um, minimize the search time or do not fly against the wind. So at each time that the individual is moving, it, says, it knows that he has to go there, that direction but it knows that if it goes in that direction, there is a wind opposite to him, so it's not going that direction, it's going somewhere else and eventually ends up there. So the, the, info, the, the background behind that is, is, um, is very interesting, but I might not explain it here. There is a lot of uncertainty there because the individuals actually, they don't know where, uh, where we have how much wind and um, so um, there is uncertainty in the decision making. So if I go this direction, I don't know. Here I know how much wind I have, but then I go there, I don't know how much wind is there. So it could be the decision that I make now is not good for the next time step. So it's really a difficult task. I don't go into the details of uh, how we design that, but uh, one thing you could see here, there is MCDM, the major part of the brain for the individual. So the, the individual is really using multi-criteria decision making um, to avoid, um, um, well, to optimize its behavior. So now I show you two things. One is the environment is very structured, actually such a wind, you see the wind with the vector field is not going to happen because this is very artificial. But one thing you can see here is that, well, first of all, the decision makers are shown with the with, um, I hope that you can see them. Um, and the optimal solution should be somewhere here. So the ones without the environment, uh, of course, they go somewhere there. And those who are in the environment, what you, can, what you can see here, they follow the wind. So they, we give them the ability to identify where is the wind. They go there and use the wind and they fly with the wind and try to save energy by flying the wind, with the wind. You can see here how well they follow this. And the other thing is that if you give them a lot of intelligence, like the capability to make a decision, it doesn't always work. It, it doesn't work if you have an environment like this. Actually, that environment is not there. But it says the intelligent behavior is not working if we have very weird sort of environment. So um, environment is a huge aspect in, in decision making. And uh, another example that I brought with me before I go towards the robotic applications is um, if we can use the environment to have a positive effect on the decision making. An example for you I brought here is um, this picture. So imagine that you have a lot of robot points moving in this environment 
and they observe their environment, but they don't know, at the end they have to make a decision how many percentage of this environment is black and how many percentage is white. What they do is that they move randomly, they gather the information, and then once they meet, they exchange the information, and I say, okay, I had five times white, you had five, two times black, and then we decide on the majority how much we have seen, and then they change their opinion. Now, the picture you can see here is a little bit tough, because uh, first of all, the colors, they show, uh, the red shows black, the white shows white, and in this picture, I don't know if you can see, the white is 52%. So the real environment has 52% white and 48% black. So it means that it's very tough, even for the human being, it's very tough to understand to, with this approach to collectively decide what is the color in the background. And they actually make it wrong. You can see here they, uh, they decided that this is black, which is not, the majority should be white. So now, I want to emphasize on the environment. One thing we could do is that, uh, which is actually a very nice thing, and, and you could say, okay, that doesn't have any applications. Actually, this has an application, and this is uh, used in robotics. If you have many robots and are swimming in the ocean, and they have uh, to identify how many algal blooms, poisoned blooms, algal blooms are in the ocean, they can use such an approach to give you an estimation how much poison you have in the ocean. Or if you have, for example, oil on the, um, in the ocean, you want to know how much you have. So you can use such approaches that the robots can make a decision and give you some, deliver you some information how serious the situation is. So, but um, that's the real application. Now let's make it a toy out of that. And what we did was that we wanted to know if we change the environment, we can make this behavior better. So that was the behavior you saw before. And now what we do is that we use some isomorphic transformations. And isomorphic transformations are those transformations that you change the order. So that the relationship between black and white stays the same, but you, you reorder your environment. And now you can see that by changing the environment, the individuals uh, are even faster than here, and uh, they can give us the value white in a very short time, actually. So environment has, as a, as, a, as a summary for myself, is that if we can somehow change the environment, we can really support the decision-making and uh, the intelligent behavior of our robots. Uh, one thing we do is that we put in the lab some ventilators to produce wind to help the robots to make better decisions and um, have better, better um, behaviors. So talking about the robots, I have established a robotic lab with flying robots, but also other robots. And I do multi-criteria decision-making because it's in my blood to do multi-objective optimization. So everyone in, who is working with me gets this doing multi-objective optimization. Even the robots, they have to do that. And um, so these robots are made by myself and my students. And what we do is that we don't give them the ability to communicate with each other. What they do is that they only have ultrasound sensors. And the ultrasound sensors, they can just tell you if there is another entity next to you or not. It's like birds, you know, when birds are flying, they do not have Bluetooth communications. They just sense if there is someone in front or not. So uh, we have these robots, and now we want to make them a little bit more intelligent. And uh, here is... Um, Simulation first. So going from theory, uh, in simulation, we are, in theory, we are rather perfect, right? In theory, we are, uh, in the simulation, we are, let's say, and this is a physics-based simulation, so it, we, are, we are fine. And in practice, you will see we are a disaster. So it's like the, the relationship, the practice, the real hardware is really, really difficult to implement. But one thing you can see here, which is interesting, and that happens a lot in my lab, is that since they are not communicating with each other in that sense, they are only sensing, and we tell them, whenever you sense another one, you have to go and be in the swarm. So um, they come here one after the other. This is the simulation that I'm, I have implemented. So uh, the robots enter the room, 
and uh, they are connected to each other in a way that they sense each other in the moment they sense they have some kind of attraction and repulsion capability to stay in the swarm. And you can see that some, swarm, some member arrived here and he detected the wall and he thinks that this is another swarm member. So he is doing attraction and repulsion with the wall. So whenever we have the swarm flying, uh, there are some of them standing in front of the walls and uh, trying to, thinking that they are in the, in the swarm as if they are not, actually. So if I um, implement that, these two will never end up in the swarm. So um, I think I need to speed up so I go faster. And now you can see the real robot who is thinking at real time. So um, unfortunately, I cannot show you how it is uh, thinking. But he has a multi-criteria decision making and also he's keeping distance to one of my PhD students who is with his mobile in the cage. And it's a fully autonomous system, so he's keeping, he's going away from the distance, uh, from the human and also from the walls. And he's actually keeping quite, um, it, it's very similar if you are wanting to catch a, a bird. It's, it really gives you the feeling if they are going, um, different ways, uh, it's actually uh, life is similar to the life one. So now we can have other decision making uh, approaches again here in simulation and then later I'll show you in. So here this is the individual moving and you see where if this point shows where he's thinking to go. This individual, we, give, we gave it here some very narrow area and it's making it's a rather let's say brave individual with a very uh, in the weighted sum approach, we gave him the, the weight that he is very risky. So he goes through the wall. And now this one, you can see uh, the, the green point says that where he's thinking to go next time step. You can see here, comes here and he knows that he has to go here. But at this point, it's too risky for him. He doesn't enter, changes its mind, comes down here. And here he will see that again, here it's too narrow for him. The weight vector that we gave it to him is basically saying that you can't go like that point that I showed you in the video. Comes here, turns back and goes back and forth and he's not able to make it. And of course we can have agents who have different characters, like in the Monte Carlo research approach, where we can, uh, it can, uh, first of all, he, he's supposed to go for this, and then he comes here, it's too narrow, his weight vector uh, is giving him the information, no, you can't go that way, you cannot make the decision here. And then uh, he forgets this one, he has still a little bit of energy, he goes back to this, takes this one, then changes his weight, so he's permanently changing its own weight according to his energy level and the task which is being fulfilled. And then eventually he comes back and will catch this one as well. So now, the video about um, dynamic environment. So in order to make a dynamic environment, we have two agents. One is this fully autonomous agent who has the multi-criteria decision-making in brain. And this one is the human operator who is making it very difficult for the other one, producing a lot of um, flow. And this one is actually keeping very quiet, as called. Um, this is, uh, if we analyze the, the behavior of this one, we, we will see that it's, it's really um, interesting how it is uh, behaving. I make it faster. Yeah, the human operator is uh, actually doing quite the job. And this one, it keeps very, very calm. So it means if we give them the ability to change just the simple weights that we give them from the multi-criteria decision making the first page of the books, then still that, and they change the weights by time, they can actually be, uh, evolve um, these uh, behaviors. Now it's another example. This one, this is dangerous point. And um, this is a fully autonomous rolling ball. And we tell him that he has to avoid this. And you can see, actually, it goes very close and then comes back and says, no, I, I don't want to go there. So it's uh, very difficult to control the movement, but uh, it is actually doing that. And here we tell him that uh, you cannot go here. He comes here and says, oh, two dangerous points. 
and he implements the approach that I showed you based on epsilon constraint decision making and eventually goes very close to this one, but they, they make it. it makes it. And another example, and the last example, is the, if you have two decision makers in two different time scales, that makes everything very interesting. So this is a fully autonomous ball, and this is a football player, but this is very slow, and this is very fast. Actually, this has to play a football with him, but it can't. So if you can see here, uh, it doesn't work. So it means if you have systems in two different time scales, uh, you, these intelligent approaches uh, might not work, and we really need to find, uh, it's actually a, a one of my, my uh, current research topics, how can we work on different time scales? And here, um, just um, the swarm of four of them flying, and they try to keep the, uh, the same height, the same height, um, like birds flying in the sky. So they do not communicate with each other. And basically what we do, again there, we have two optimized variables that we give them, so two points from the Pareto front, and they have to actually f jump from one to the other over time, and they try to keep the, find the, the same height as um, like birds in the sky. So now I come to the conclusions. Well, I talked about multi-objective optimization, or rather multi-objective, multi-criteria decision-making. I think um, real-time multi-criteria decision-making is going to be a very interesting topic and um, a challenge for technical systems. I think we really need to push that in that direction. And uh, the, th the third point I want to say is that the decisions can be influenced by the dynamic environments. And, uh, we could also see if we can use it in a positive way to uh, influence the uh, individuals. So that's all. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you.